Psalm 16, the Revised Standard Version. Preserve me, O God, for in thee I take refuge. I say to the Lord, Thou art my Lord, I have no good apart from thee. As for the saints in the land, they are the noble, in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows, their libations of blood I will not pour out, or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. Thou holdest my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad. My soul rejoices. My body also dwells secure. For thou dost not give me up to Sheol, or let thy godly one see the pit. Thou dost show me the path of life. In thy presence there is fullness of joy. In thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16, the Revised Standard Version, the Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word. Almighty Father, we come before you. We ask for your help, your aid, for our weak, for our blessing, for our encouragement. God, we cannot pray that we are without sin, but we pray coming to you that Jesus has covered all our sin by his blood. And we ask, Lord, that you hear us for Jesus' sake, that you help us for Jesus' sake. And so it is in Jesus' name and by his name alone we pray. In Jesus' name, come Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now this psalm, Psalm 16, is a bit of a difficult psalm uh, to translate and interpret. There's a couple difficult passages. We won't do all of them, just really one of them we will mention. This is my own understanding of how to translate this after prayer and study. Uh, it is a little different than what you will find in some other Bibles, but I believe it is a reliable opinion and I can uh, defend it and I can explain it. So first, how about we put Psalm 16 in its proper place in the scripture so we can understand it. Psalms 15 to 24, which we mentioned last week, they, they form a unit. They form a unit discussing a great mystery. Psalm 15 asks, Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. And it goes on to essentially say that the only person who is worthy to approach God, to approach him, is someone who is perfect. And the person who is perfect to them, God has given a magnificent promise. He says that they shall not be moved. That's how Psalm 15 actually ends. They shall not be moved. The righteous will not be moved. The person who is blameless, who has no sin, they have the Almighty God on their side. There is nothing that will overcome them. There is nothing that will defeat them. The person who fully trusts in God is totally secure. Now this presents a bit of a problem. Because the righteous are often in distress. And that's kind of where Psalm 16 begins. Preserve me, O God, for in thee I take refuge. Psalm 16 says, Lord, you've said you would keep me, that I should not be moved because I've taken refuge in you. It's a prayer for help from the person who is trusted totally in God. Now, verse 2, which is, which is, reads, sorry, I say to the Lord, thou art my Lord, I have no good apart from thee. Verse 2 should be translated a different way. You see, in Hebrew, underneath, it doesn't say, I say to the Lord. Verse 2 actually reads, you have said to the Lord, thou art my Lord, I have no good apart from thee. Now, if we read that together, preserve me, O God, for in thee I take refuge, you have said to the Lord, Thou art my Lord, I have no good apart from thee. Maybe we can see why the translators chose in many English translations to go with, I say to the Lord instead of you. The you seems like a mistake, even though it's what the Hebrew says. It says you, 
There are other translations like the Greek which instead have I. So some translators have chosen to go with the first person instead of the second person because this switch from first to second person seems like a mistake. It seems like an, an accident or something. It doesn't really make sense. But I think it only doesn't make sense if we don't see the flow of this psalm. The Hebrew is 100%, in my view, correct in this case. Now, there's a French scholarly translation of the Bible, La Bible de Jerusalem. This is the, the newer edition. And in the French Bible, they have kept the second person. And so it reads, Tu as dit à Yahweh, c'est toi, mon Seigneur, mon bonheur n'est pas au-dessus de toi. Which, if we were to translate it, says, You've said to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no greater happiness than you. And so if we put it together, it would go, Preserve me, O God, for in thee I take refuge. Then it's almost as if someone listening to the prayer of the psalmist says to him, You've said to the Lord, You are my Lord. I have no greater happiness than you. You say you trust in God. You say God is all that you depend on. He is your refuge. He's what you rely on. Explain that to me. What does it mean? It is very common in the Hebrew Bible to have multiple voices in one passage without proper warning. If you read the Song of Songs, you will, you will have often this switch from the lover, the beloved, and then this other third group asking questions to the lover and to the beloved. This is exactly what is happening here. The psalmist is praying, Preserve me, O God, for in thee I take refuge. And someone listening says to the psalmist, Well, you said to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no greater happiness than you. Can you really claim God as your help? Is almost this question. What does it really mean to say, I have no good apart from God? And so verses 3 to 8, which we will call the second part of the psalm, is the psalmist explaining what it means to take refuge in God and to have no good apart from God. He's answering this question. And what he goes on to say is that, this, that he delights in God's saints. How God defends his saints. God sustains his saints. God is a real God. Contrary to those who worship fake gods and don't receive help from God no matter what they do. The psalmist declares he wouldn't worship a fake God. Nor would he even let himself speak the name of a fake God. He says that in verses 3 to 4. Then in verses 5 to 8, he declares that God has already given him every good thing, despite the fact that he's praying for help. His whole life is a blessing from God, and God has kept him constantly. That's what it means when he says, The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup, thou holdest my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. It's talking about like property division, my property lines, my boundary lines. I have a good home. I have a good life you've allotted to me, God. And so he says, because he trusts in the Lord alone, he delights in God's saints alone, God has given him a good life, therefore he can say, I shall not be moved. That's verse 8. I keep the Lord always before me. I never forget God. Because he is at my right hand, I never make a mistake with my hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, I can pray for God to preserve me. And therefore, you can see he will help me because I've fully taken refuge in him. And look at my life. I have no happiness apart from God. That's the second part of the psalm. Now, the third part of the psalm is almost a prophecy. It's the psalmist declaring what is going to happen to his prayer. Because that it begins with this prayer, right? Preserve me, O God, for in thee I take refuge. Then he is asked, Oh, that you have said to the Lord, the Lord is my Lord. I have no good apart from him. The psalmist explains himself to this person. And then he declares to this person what is going to happen. Namely, that he is going to be delivered. God is going to answer his prayer. And God is not going to deliver him in part, but in whole. Verse 9 reads, My heart is glad, my soul is glad, and my body is secure. My soul, spirit, and body are safe and preserved. My whole being has protected by God. And even death itself 
will not be able to defeat the psalmist. That's verse 10. For thou dost not give me up to Sheol, or let thy godly one see the pit. But there's something kind of hidden there in verse 10. In order to say, you know, God won't even let me die, you kind of got to come close to death to say something like that. So the psalmist is revealing that death is going to get his hands on him. It's going to get close to him. It's going to grab him, but death won't have dominion over him no matter what. God will not let death have the final victory over the psalmist because, verse 11, thou dost show me the path of life. This is a picture of like descending into the darkness of the grave. And in the grave, the psalmist finds himself surrounded by blackness and the power of death. But then a light shines and it shows the psalmist the path out of death to God. That's verse 11. Thou dost show me the path of life. In thy presence there is fullness of joy. In thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. You know what's so beautiful about that? That is an inversion of verse 8. Verse 8 says, I keep the Lord always before me. His presence is always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Verse 11 flips that. In God's presence, when I am in God's presence, there is fullness of joy. And when I am in God's right hand, there is pleasure forevermore. It's a beautiful little poetic unit right there. Let's summarize all of this together. Psalm 16 is the psalmist asking God for help. He is in a situation, it would seem, where his life is at risk and he's in danger. And he's essentially challenged on his righteousness. Verse 2, I, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, I have no good apart from thee. Declare your righteousness to us. What, what have you done? And so the psalmist from verses 3 to 8 explains how he's trusted in the Lord. He delights only in those that follow the Lord. He doesn't love any wickedness at all. And he is totally happy with the life God has given him. He has nothing between him and God. That is an essential thing to notice. And because of this, he is able to be delivered by God from death itself. But it's going to be a close call. His sinlessness will save him from death, but death is still coming close. Trouble is still there. I mean, that's why he's praying. You know, trouble is upon him and it's grabbing him. But not only will his soul be saved, not only will his spirit be saved, but his body itself will escape from the rotting of the grave. And what's so obvious about this, I think we can really see this as a picture of Jesus. How Jesus, through his sinlessness, descended into the grave. And yet though he died, he did not die. Death could not conquer him. It could not overcome him. And in that dark grave, there was a path shown to Christ. And he escaped from the clutches of hell. And made a way for everyone to go to be with the Father. For in my Father's house there are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Psalm 16 verses 10 and 11. For thou dost not give me up to Sheol, or let thy godly one see the pit. You don't let me die. You show me the path of life. In thy presence there is fullness of joy. That's a promise of Jesus going to heaven. And that's a promise for every single believer. But... What's so marvelous about this psalm is what it actually reminds me of when I read this. It reminds me of when Christ is standing before the chief priests in Matthew 26. When he's been betrayed by Judas, his disciples have abandoned him. And he's standing before those who have their hands on him to take his life. And there they challenge him. They challenge him and then later on they even mock him for claiming he is the son of of God. He essentially declares God will preserve him because he takes refuge in God. And then they mock him when he declares this. They say, prophesy to us, Christ, who is it that struck you? Thou art my Lord. You say you have no good apart from God. Let's see if he defends you now. I'm going to read to you that portion from Matthew. I think it's very wonderful to hear it. And you will see, I think, Psalm 16, as I've just described in Matthew 26, verses 59 to 68. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death. But they found none. The many false witnesses came forward. At last two came forward and said, 
This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent, not out of fear, though, but out of confidence. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. You know, Psalm 15 says, who keeps his oath even to his hurt. I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus declares who he is. Jesus said to them, you have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. You're going to see me in God's presence at his right hand. That's how you're going to see me. Jesus isn't afraid of them killing him. He is not afraid because he knows death won't defeat him. Psalm, uh, ver- sorry, verse 65. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spat in his face and struck him. And some of them slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Messiah. Who is it that struck you? If you truly are the anointed one of God, declare it to us now. Explain yourself to us, O Christ. I think Psalm 16 reveals the confidence of Jesus before those who sought to take his life because Jesus knew his own sinlessness. He knew his own identity. He could stand before them without fear. You know, there's a marvelous verse that is so often quoted, and we go now to our application in 1 John 4. In 1 John, sorry, chapter 4, which is, Perfect love casts out fear, for he who fears has not been perfected in love. John goes on to say, and this is the part we don't quote, that we know that we are perfect in love because we obey him in everything. We are not afraid of what God will do because we've done nothing wrong. We are perfect in our love. John puts great emphasis on love and obedience. Jesus says famously, if you love me, you will obey me. And Jesus is identified in all the gospels as the one who always does the will of the Father. He never does any wrong. He is always fully obedient. And because he is fully obedient, he doesn't have to fear before death itself because he knows God's promises and he knows his own righteousness. Can we say that? Well, we can't. I mean, John tells us straight, if anyone says he has no sin, he deceives himself and the truth is not in us. Right? We, we can't say we don't have sin, but yet we can because we've been washed by the blood of Jesus. When God looks at us, he sees Jesus. He sees the sinless Christ. That is the blood offering poured out. The drink offering of blood poured out. The only acceptable offering is Jesus. All our own works, anything we offer with our own hands, our own life, our own drink offering of blood is just an offering to a false God. We cannot do anything to truly worship God on our own. We're not worthy to even approach him. We can't truly come before him and be in his presence without Jesus. See, Jesus, he is the perfect one, and we are one with him when we believe in him. And because of our union with Christ, we are able to stand confidently before God. You see, every Christian, our confidence in prayer does not come from our own sinlessness, but from Jesus' love for us. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, what will separate us from the love of Christ? The love of Christ. Friend, Jesus loves you. Romans tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And it is because of his cross, which is the proof of his love. No greater love has man than this, than he laid down his life for his friend. Because of Jesus' finished work on the cross, Because of his love for us, I can approach God. If I was to approach without Jesus, that would be idolatry. Uh, That would be false worship. I cannot approach the Father without the Son. I cannot. I'm not worthy. And the sooner we 
understand that, the more peace of mind we'll have in our lives. I mean, friend, don't try to make yourself perfect. Lean on Christ. He will instruct you in the night season. That's what the psalm says. He will guide you. He'll show you where you have to grow and improve. He'll lead you there. And until you get there, you have the blood to cover you. So simply obey what he tells you to do and move forward in that blood. Well, this went much longer than I meant it to. I apologize for that. But I will read for you now my paraphrase of Psalm 16 in a moment here. Let me just get it up there so I can see it. All right. Psalm 16, a homiletical paraphrase of the Psalms. Keep me, O Lord, for you are my castle. You have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, and there is nothing I value apart from you. Your saints are mighty in the earth and are all my delight. People who chase after other gods become more frail. I won't fill my cup with offerings for them. I won't even let my lips speak their names. The Lord is my choice forever, and he fills my cup with himself. All that I could be is in his hands, and he has given me a great life. It has been arranged wonderfully. I bless the Lord for all the advice he has given me. In the night my soul is stirred. It reveals my path. The Lord is always on my mind. With my hand, I could reach out and touch him. Because of this, I will endure forever. My heart is happy. My soul is joyful. In safety, my tired body rests. Because you won't let the doors of death shut me in. You won't let the one you've set apart for yourself rot in the grave. You show me the way out of death. When I reach you, there will be nothing but joy. When I touch your hand, I will be happy forever. Psalm 16, the homiletical paraphrase of the Psalms.